that Steve said that, that, that what a lot of people know about the Alamo necessarily isn't so. And, and there's, there's two Alamos. There's the traditional Alamo that everybody more or less grows up with. And then if you, if you cross over and start looking at the evidence, then that there's another Alamo. And they both really kind of wind up at the same place where you look at and going, well, that's a kind of a, an important heroic thing. Um, they're both, both interesting. And I, I tend to, what we have is visitors that will look at the traditional story and they'll go, I just can't believe that. You know, why would they stay there? You know, who would in their right man, minds would do that? And if you can tell them the evidence-based story, kind of cross over and say, well, this is what was going on, they'll often go, that's a fantastic story. I never knew that. They never taught that to me in mm -hmm. grade school or college. And, and there's a real, a real story there. The, one of the, the, it, the Alamo is kind of like a religion to some people, and and so one of the would it be a would it be a religious would be a, a part of the scriptures is you know, it's Travis drawing the line. I mean we I mean we talk about the Alamo Trinity. Uh, it, it was in a church. Uh, March six was on a Sunday. We talk about the uh, sacrifice at the Alamo and the redemption at San Jacinto. Uh, yeah, there are religious overtones. <laughs> and when you look at the line, there is uh, part, of, part of the fallacy in the canard is that Travis is writing these letters and nobody's coming. You know, 32 men from Gonzales come. But you know, what's happening with those other texts? Mm -hmm. Nobody's coming. And there is a, a, a letter that Major Williamson, a friend of Travis, writes. And it's captured on the day of the battle. And then it's two weeks later, it's published in a, a Mexican newspaper. And uh, we have the translation of that. But essentially, Williamson is saying, for God's sake, hold on. Help is coming. Yeah. Which sort of removes the reason for going, well, nobody's coming. And then you look at, well, where does this mind story come from? And it's kind of, there's a person named William P. Zuber, and it's, it's kind of fanciful. And he doesn't do himself any credit because he says, I heard this story from my mother who heard it from Moses Rose. I changed part of it, but he never says what he changed. And so it, it, it leaves some things that are questionable. Also, when you look at the history of Texans, they're taking votes all the time. What are we going to do? And so would Travis have done something like that? Possibly. Do we have the evidence for it? No, we really don't. And so I would, I would not go up to somebody and say, God, do you believe that line story still? Well, everybody knows that didn't happen. You know, what I would do instead is, is offer you the, the history. And, you know, this is how it's an interesting story. You know, here's the story behind the story. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it, it's we, we never necessarily tell people, you know, don't believe that. Now, I, I didn't say we never do that, but we had a, we had a, an employee here once who's, who a father brought his two sons down. And he was standing out in front of the church, and you know where the line is. And David overheard them saying, father telling them, you know, this is where Travis draws the line. And David, who's now a PhD student, done very well for himself, but he steps in and says, well, no, let me tell you what happened. So we get an email from this man's wife saying, my husband had waited for years for the sons to get old enough that he could take them to the Alamo and tell them. And 
you know, your idiot guide spoiled that moment for them. So, so you have to be careful how you handle those things. Well, the, what the line is, is not history, but it's a parable. It's like Washington and the and the cherry tree. Did, did that did that happen? No, it didn't. But is it a way to communicate a values to to young people? Will it hurt kids to hear that story? Probably not. Will it hurt kids to to? hear the line story and ask themselves, as we all do, well, what would I have done standing there? Would, would I have crossed the line? And, 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 and that's, that's the value of parables. Now, what we have to do, okay, is graze our myths and our histories in different pastures, <laughs> because what 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 is pernicious for both individuals and societies is when we start accepting our myths and our parables as history. You, you might want to ask the Germans about that <laughs> when when they start believing their myths. So, you know, is it, is, is it a bad thing that we have myths, that we have these parables? No, I don't think so. In fact, we would be hard pressed to, to remove that from the story. And I wouldn't want to remove that from the story because that's, that's part of the story. It's not part of the history. So we just need to make that distinction. And we can, we can live with both the, the mythic Alamo we can have our line, as long as we understand this is part of the history, or it's part of the story, but it's not part of the history. And, and, and that's a, 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 an emotional sort of canard that if you're, you know, did he or did he not. One of the things that we deal with, one of the things that we deal with often is um, from the John Wayne movie. People come here, and uh, the Alamo is an abandoned mission in the middle of nowhere. And if you believe that, it's not going to, you know, emotionally, that's not going to, you know, tear you up inside if someone says, you know, that's not true. But it will certainly clarify if you go, it never was abandoned. It was always put to another use. That would have been a surprise to the Lasoya family, but <laughs> if it never was abandoned, always put to another use, and it's always put to another use because Battle of the Alamo is not over the Alamo; it's over the town of San Antonio, which is across the river, and the town of San Antonio was an important place. So it's not worthless; it's not in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of space to get to the Rio Grande or to get to the Louisiana border, but it's an important place. And because of that space, that's one of the reasons it's so important. Because of the population center, because of a garrison there, economic center, political center, crossroads. And so it, the reason that's important is if you go to, the, again, the, the traditional story, and the Alamo is such an unimportant place, and yet they're willing to, you know, Sam Houston told them to leave. And they're so stubborn, they just stayed there. <laughs> you know, That's a canard. It's, you know, why did they do that? Why would they do to that? You know, I, I can't believe that they would do that. But if you go, no, San Antonio was an important place. Santa Ana thought so. Mm -hmm. Travis thought so. Bowie thought so. Governor Henry Smith thought so. The council thought so. Sam Houston didn't think so. But it's an important place. And so it's so important that you have two battles, the Battle of Behar in December, uh -huh. and this is sort of Revolution 101, rebels capture something. Next phase is gonna be the government comes to retake it, and that's the Battle of the Alamo. And if you can get those two things, I don't wanna say straight in your mind, but if you can 
be cognizant and kind of realize that's what's happening, you're like, well, this whole takes on a whole different aspect as opposed people are here, they're, they're, they're just here to make a point. You know, they get killed. We've got to somehow salvage that, so let's remember them. No, it's an important thing, and there are people on their way. They just don't get here in time. Well, well let me expand on that, Bruce. <clears throat> How many of you have read uh, that Sam Houston ordered the Alamo blown up, the garrison, and, and if those people had just followed orders, they could have saved their lives? Have, have you? Okay, Mo most of us had some. Well, that was something that was started by Houston biographers. <laughs> well, it was. And uh, the, the problem with biographers is they only read the letters that Sam Houston wrote. And on uh, January 17th, uh, 1836, he writes a letter to Governor Henry Smith, the, the, the head of the provisional government. Uh, he, he writes a, a letter from uh, Goliath. And he says, look, I've sent Bowie over to... Uh, uh, to, to the Alamo to abandon the place and, and, and pull out. And if you think well of it, we will do this. And the sooner this can be authorized, the better it will be. Well, clearly Houston wants to abandon the Alamo, but just as clearly he's asking permission from the civilian authority to do this. Well, Bowie arrives in the Alamo two days later. He meets J.C. Nell. He says, hey, I love what you've done to the place. <laughs> uh, he says, I think we could actually hold this. And so Bowie, on his own, and Neil write a letter to uh, uh, Governor Smith saying, well, we'd rather die in these ditches than give it up. Well, that comports to what Governor Smith was thinking himself. He says, look, we spent blood and treasure to, to get this place, and, and, and now we're just going to walk away from it? That doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, and, and two, it blocks Camino Real. I mean, there are two main arteries coming up from the interior of Mexico, uh, you, and, and San Antonio blocks one, and Goliad blocks the other. And you've got forts at both places. So these are skeleton picket guards watching the frontier. And the plan is, let's, let's halt the Mexicans on the frontier, uh, not let them penetrate through uh, to, the, to the settlements. So Governor Smith thinks about uh, Houston's request, and the answer is no, Sam. Uh, we understand your reasons, but no, we've got to. Well, about this same time, uh, Governor Smith fires the council. The council impeaches Governor Smith. And for a period of time, Texas is blessed with two competing governments. And Governor Smith and the council can't agree about much. But the one thing they can't agree on is we have got to hold San Antonio. Now, I'm going to read you something. And the reason I'm going to read it to you is because it's a, it's a quotation and I want to get it right. On uh, January 21st, responding to Houston's advice to Governor Smith on January 17th, this dispatch he, where he's asking permission, members of the council directed that, and this is where the quotation begins, an express be sent immediately to Bayer with orders from the acting governor, now this would have been James W. Robinson, commanding the orders of General Houston be uh, remanded, and that the commandant, this would be J.C. Neal at this point, be required to put the pay, place in the best possible state for defense. Now, listen carefully here. With assurances, every possible effort is making to strengthen, supply, and provision the garrison, and in no cows to abandon or surrender the place unless the last extremity. So that's the order J.C. Neal actually received from the civilian authority. 
And of course, those were the, after, after Neil left, these were the orders that, 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 that Travis was acting under. So to recap, yes, Houston wanted to abandon the Alamo. He asked permission, the answer was no, and instead the, the, the government wrote down Neil and says, no, for God's sakes, hold on to that place. So this explains a lot. Now, now fast forward to, to uh, 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 February 24th and the famous letter that we all used to have to memorize, but we don't anymore. So uh, to, to, you know, Texans and all Americans in the world. And uh, what's he saying in that letter? He says, okay guys, uh, they're here. <laughs> uh, you know, this is what we've planned to do all along. We'd holler out when, when they got here and you would, you would siphon down to these strategic choke points. Well, they're here and uh, we can't hold them indefinitely, but we can, we can hold them till you get down here. But, but you, you know, hurry because, you know, we're, we're surrounded by 2,000 of these guys and, you know, so that makes Travis's letter of the 24th make a lot more sense. And, and indeed, uh, every letter, and, and it's kind of a shame that we focus so much on the letter of the 24th because there's valuable information in, in all the extant letters that Travis wrote from the Alamo, but in every single one, he's saying, uh, okay, guys, where are you? Because the government has promised them we're not going to hang you out to dry. So it prompts the question, why didn't the government respond? Because the government that should have and, and could have organized those relief or efforts had fallen apart in dissension and discord. And one of the things that kind of picked this yeah. up is that, um, again, going back to nobody's coming. Well, when you begin to look at letters written not in San Antonio, but written a bit further back, people aren't coming. Yeah. But you know, they don't have the ability to send text to Travis, you know, hey, we're coming. You know, the email, you know, the internet was down, and and, 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 and just getting from... Well, it was government internet. Yeah. <laughs> getting from place to place took time. Yeah. And so, the Battle of the Alamo is really, you know, the siege is, what, two weeks? It takes about a week for the word to get out, and then it takes about a week for the response. And what then happens is on... When, when Houston does show up at Gonzales on March 11th, he finds 350 men under James C. Neal ready to march off to the aid of the Alamo. Yeah. And so if you're kind of doing the math and you're like, well, that's the 11th, Alamo fell on the 6th. Now, this is what's important. You know, one of those canards is that Sam Houston has been graced with time purchased by the Alamo. Thank you, John Wayne. His army. And no, he has been treated with the Cherokees. He's been at the convention. He, he hasn't been building an army. When he gets there on Gonzales, March 11th, that's his army. The relief group that has assembled for the aid of the Alamo. And that's where he then begins retreating eastward and adding to. And those Alamo relief forces under J.C. Neal uh, proved to be the nucleus of, of the San Jacinto Army. But, but here's a delicious irony Sam Houston. Uh, tells the people at, at uh, Washington on the Brazos, if any mortal power will prevail, I will save those brave men at the Alamo. He leaves Washington on the evening of March 6th. Mm -hmm. 